welcome to the planet Bodhi. <laughs> I'm super excited to have you with us, man. It's it's good to see you, and it's good to see that you're quarantined and you are masked up, uh, avoiding the uh, the COVID nineteen. This is this is ground zero, you know. I don't mess around, you know. No, Miami's ground zero, my man. This place is on <laughs> fire. I know. That's why I'm wearing this. <laughs> So, so Mark, we got a lot to go through today. Um, I just want to remind folks, this is going to be unusual. I've never done this, uh, this, uh, this type of show because we're going to do a show and tell, which I'm super excited because you have so many cool things to share. Uh, but before we start, um, let me just read off something really quick about you so that people know a little bit about you um, if, they already, if they don't already. Um, of course, you are the son of the legendary cartoonist Juan Bode. Or is it Bode or Bodhi? Bodhi. Bodhi. There we I go. Can't, I can't talk with this thing on stuff. <laughs> <laughs> it's a that's like that's a Russian it's a Russian mask. They don't mess around with the uh, cloth ones we have. Not at all. That's why uh, I don't hear about them having the COVID over there. No. So a bit about you, uh, Mark. You attended the school, uh, the art school of Oakley, uh, in Oakland, California. Your professional job was for Heavy Metal magazine when you were asked to color your father's black and white strip, Zooks, yeah. which, which I remember, the first lizard in orbit when he was 15. You were 15, rather. Yeah, uh, I, I have the uh, Heavy Metal right here. Wow. And um, this was... Uh, this was my first coloring job when I was 15 years old. It still kind of holds up. I, was, I, was, I wasn't bad, you know. You know I, what? I, I, I'm going to skip this bio thing and jump right in with you. Tell, tell me about um, what it was like when you were a kid um, with your father, uh, Vaughn. Uh, paint, paint the picture for us of, of where this was, uh, what state. Uh, and how how old you were? Um. Okay. Well, I was in um, I was born in Utica, New York, which is kind of a kind of a nowhere kind of armpit of a place. It, it in upstate New York. It um, it used to be, you know, in its heyday in the '40s and '50s, it was uh, you know run by the mob and. Uh, and it was, you know, when I was a kid, it was like bustling. But once the mob moved out, I, I guess, you know, the, sh the you know, the, the business moved out and, uh, and all the people moved away, the money went away. So now it's just kind of like, um, kind of a slow town. But my father and I, uh, and my mom, we moved to Syracuse. And um, that's where a lot of my dad's stuff like his classic stuff, you know, the erotica and the Cheech Wizard and all that stuff. Like Cheech Wizard was created in Syracuse, New York. And, and what was he doing before he arrived at the Cheech Wizard and, and the underground comic style scene and so on? What was he doing? Yeah, what kind of art artist was he? Oh, well, he was he was trying his hardest, you know, like he was so different. It was hard to get work, you know, like, He'd go to uh, Marvel or DC in New York City as a 20 year old. And he had big dreams and stuff. And he would take his portfolio and show it to them. And they'd throw it back at him and say, you know, come back when you learn how to draw. And uh, my dad was so heartbroken. He went back and burned a lot of his stuff. And um, it's unfortunate for us because we lost a lot of stuff. But he was so prolific that, um, you know, he just said, he said, I'm going to do it my way. And he didn't do it the Marvel way or DC or, or Disney. He, he did, he created his own worlds and did it his way. And uh, much to our benefit, you know. Right. And, and, and this was uh, presumably during, he was developing these characters during the psychedelic era, perhaps? Uh, this, this is before, I mean, 1957, Oh, you know, that's right. 1957, he created Cheech Wizard. 
You, you know what, Mark? I remember some of his early illustrations of uh, and some characters, and um, they were figurative characters, but they were dressed very much 50s with shirt and tie and that tight haircut. Yeah. Yeah, well, he was, he was getting, like, commercial jobs, you know, really sucky commercial jobs. Um, you know, we were living in the projects, you know, when I was born. Um, we hardly had any money. My mom, you know, fed us for the most part because my dad was just had dreams and he couldn't get much work. So, um, you know, so, uh, you know, it wasn't all, you know, good from the get go. We, we were living pretty, pretty slim there. Um, but, um, but his, his imagination was racing, you know, like he was a creative dynamo and he knew that his comics were going to be bigger than, um, than just comics. He, he knew it was going to be big. He didn't, he just didn't know how. And but he knew that it wasn't at, at that point, um, Give me an idea of what underground comics, the rise of underground comics, the alternative. Because I mean, if if you look at these, this particular Cheech Wizard, you see a a, a nude woman, very busty, the Bode broad as we Bode broad as we we love. Um, you know, really racy for the time, isn't it? Well, that was more like 1968, 69, 70. Um, Previous to that was Mad Magazine, you know, Harvey Kurtzman, um, you know, my dad and Harvey were, were friends, but they never worked together really. But, um, but Harvey Kurtzman created Mad in like 1960 or something like that. And it, that was like the first step, you know, into the underground. And then my father came along in 63, the year that I was born. And he did uh, Das Kampf, which was uh, a parody of of uh, uh, Charles Schultz, um, Love Is, and my dad did War Is, yes. and and so so my dad printed up on a ditto copier, you know, one of those old ditto machines that yeah yeah I remember people those people don't ever heard of, <laughs> you know, but he was cranking away his own comic, and he only did a hundred of them. And and it was called Dust Conf, and a, and a copy of that can go for about six to eight thousand dollars now if you get a good copy. Did you did you keep any? I do. Um, unfortunately, uh, my father cut a lot of them up because he didn't think they'd be worth anything. So um, he made dummy books out of them to show publishers. So I have a lot of cut up versions. Unfortunately, <laughs> yeah. So let me, let me ask you, as a kid, when you start seeing these illustrations, first of all, they look super kid friendly, but the content is adult, right? Uh, when, you, when you think of the cast of characters in the Bodhi universe, uh, from Cobalt 60, the Lizards, the Bodhi Broads, um, you know, he's, he's really interesting in, in that they're so approachable and lovable, but yet, the content and the storytelling is is mature. Well, it was a tragic. Uh, these these little characters have tragic lives, you know, like like our own. You know, we don't. Know, it's not all good, you know, down here on uh, on the planet, you know. And um, so he he had a very tough childhood, you know, living in the streets, and the and the and, and the Bodie family was broken up. And his siblings were out in the street, you know, uh, stealing from the grocery store and and uh, and getting arrested and, and blowing things up and torturing animals. It wasn't good. <laughs> that's a, you know what? That's so unusual to hear because of his, you know, some of the images that we see of him. He's very much kind of like a, an eccentric kind of a, a of, of that hippie generation. Well, he you know, I, there was an evolution that happened. And uh, uh, what happened was, you know, like, this childhood was so terrible that, uh, that he found an escape into his comics. And so he'd create these worlds. And, 
and all the inhabitants and the universe and name all the planets and stuff. And then he would go there and he would be safe. So, so everything could be going wrong around him. His father's drunk, you know, beating up everybody in the family. It was bad. And, uh, but my father found his safe place and much to our benefit, we, um, he, he went into those places and went so deep. And, and it wasn't just the drawings, was it, right? Because he wrote quite a lot. Um, you, you shared uh, some of his, his uh, I guess, diary at one point. That's yeah. ph phenomenal. I got, some, I got like the 1963 diary here. Yeah. Please he share wrote, some. He wrote every day, every day. And, um, and here is, uh, here's a picture of, of me when I was born <laughs> <laughs> and I drew a line ar uh, across it when he showed it to me when I was a little like <laughs> five years old and I didn't like the drawing and I, <laughs> I grabbed the pencil and, and you know crossed him out and he's like what get away from me kid <laughs> and he wrote so, so Mark looking back right and getting uh, you know getting to understand your father when you have something like a diary uh, of his intimate secrets and 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 life, um, what's that like for you? Well, I you know I have to find I, I don't read them a lot because it's it's kind of depressing. A lot of the stuff in there was was him uh, him uh, venting, you know, like um, just his depression and and all that. So so it wasn't all like today I'm creating this and today you know when everything's you know happy and go lucky you know tripping around with Cheech it wasn't all that but the good thing was is that he would you know in these books he would draw on on every other page and like I'll show you like here is the first Cheech wizard strip he ever did wow 1964 and he drew on every other page, you know, and incredible. And, and, and that's not all. I mean, he came up with spaceships, you know, like, and, you know, like did some color drawings, you know, you know this, this was on a daily basis. And Mark, no Mark was... yeah, yeah, let me, let me check for a second. Cause you're an illustrator in your own right. Uh, you have a history in this. In terms of drawing style and aesthetic, before Vaughn's work and line that line quality, had we seen anything like that? Um, well, yeah. I mean, his influences can be traced. Like anybody's um, influence, any artist has influence. You know, we all kind of pull together our favorite stuff and we make our own out of it and um he did the same thing he he loved pogo you know like uh, walt kelly's pogo which if you go to that comic strip and google that um you'll see the oki finoki swamp and the dudes and the dats and the and the and the little forest characters like the alligator dude looks surprisingly like a lizard a little bit and um and uh, and the whole little happy world that uh, that Walt Kelly had influenced him. And then there was another one, Ali Oop, um, which a lot of people haven't heard of. Uh, that was V.T. Hamlin in the fifties and sixties, and he had a, he was a uh, a, uh, a caveman that ran uh, rode on a dinosaur, and he had huge feet. And my father got the huge feet from from Ali Oop. I mean, right. if you go check out Ali Oop. And your father also created a caveman character. Yeah. In fact, uh, if I get lucky, I could find... Oh, there he is. Yeah, that's the first page. Yeah. <laughs> man, right? What is that what he called him? The man. The man, yeah. The man oh, is... Oh, wow. That's the first page. That's That's when he was invented. Wow. Yeah. That's, that's, thank you for sharing that. Oh, man. Let, let me ask you something. As a young man, as a, as a baby, as a kid, uh, you know, of course, he's living in this world. How was he translating that world to you? 
you know, was he sharing that with you and these characters and their lives? And Oh, yeah. I mean, those were at bedtime stories, you know. I, I tell this story all the time when I get interviewed. <laughs> but but I, I, I had a very unique childhood, and I wouldn't trade it for any, any, anything else, uh, another, another childhood in a way. Um, I only had him for 12 years, but, man, it was some good years, you know. And 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 when when in the morning, I mean, he would he would stay up all night, eating Hostess snowballs and coffee, and really bad junk food. I mean, that's how he got all his 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 get go. You know, when he'd go to those planets, um, and he'd just eat the the nastiest junk food, and drink a bunch of coffee, and he would be off into another universe. And it is it the next is. morning. The next morning, he would show me the, the drawings or, or that night, you know, and he, he, he'd read me the comic strip and then he'd be like, this is what I did with Cheech Wizard last night, uh, Mark. And, uh, you know, and, and we, you know, and I believed that my dad was hanging out with Cheech. And so we went up the hill by the house, make a lunch and wait for the, the hat to show up. And uh, the hat would never show up. He said, he's coming. He's just really busy balling broads and doing tricks. He's very busy. <laughs> very, very, very busy hat. <laughs> was he teaching you how to, how to draw early on, or was that something you picked up on your own? Well, the first thing was imprinting that imagination in the, into my head, like kind of brainwashing you. You know, like, like people have Santa Claus. I had Cheech Wizard. Um, Cheech was a real dude walking up the hill and I could and what he was doing by saying he's here he's coming is I imagined him come up the hill right and so that was first so as a child I'm seeing it as real and I didn't know it wasn't real so um when my drawing skills came along later um I just started drawing the worlds you know as I saw them as he saw them. So a lot of his, uh, you know, ideas, um, like uh, he gave a lot of ideas, like I did the, the were lizards and vampire lizards and uh, um, all kinds of monster lizards, you know, Frankenstein, you know, Franken turd. That was mm -hmm. one of my ideas. Like I was drawing as, as a little seven year old, drawing away, I go, look dad. And he goes, man, that's a great idea. I'm gonna use that. And, you know, Kel, Kel painted him with Futura on a, on a train. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So outside of, outside of your father's work, um, what kind of art were you interested in? What, was in? what else was influencing you as you were coming up? Well, I didn't look at any uh, superhero comics, that's for sure. I mean, my dad, you know, as soon as the underground comic scene started happening, he had a stack of underground comics, adult comics, and he gave them to me and he goes, read, but don't show your friends. <laughs> and and Wait, I- Are these I, like art from Fritz the Cat and things like that? Oh, everything. And, and I had like, you know, characters having sex and characters taking shits and characters taking a piss and, you know, killing each other. And, you know, that was, to me, that was comics, and uh, so, so superhero stuff just wasn't real. <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, like I, I didn't have any patience for that. And um, I remember when I, when I was seven years old. For some reason, seven years old was when my dad decided, you know, I'm going to teach my son some some tricks. And he and he and he said, okay, son, get a pencil. And he said. This is how you draw tits. And, you know, I followed him line for line. He said, if you draw them like that, you're always going to make money. And, uh, and I wish I had that piece of paper because I'd have it frame in gold. Because, uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, well, what's it's interesting, true, you know? <laughs> your, your dad was very much fascinated with bodacious women um, and sexuality. And very curious about sexuality, uh, as as it was known about him, uh, that you know it, it's it's interesting that and I mentioned this to you before how he kind of prototyped 
for me and maybe some of my friends that the Bodhi broad was the ideal girlfriend, right? Um, and, uh, and of course, you know, throughout my journeys and, and, and life, I've dated a few and chased them down. Um, but it was very interesting about him and kind of this idealization and sexualization of women. How did your mother take that? Well, she was Bodhi Broad number one. I mean, yeah. you know, you got to give credit where credit's due, man. Barbara Bodhi, mm -hmm. she was she was the first, you know, like you see her in a lot of the erotica strips and um, she was very an Italian lady. She looked a lot like Sophia Loren when she was younger, very curvaceous. And my my father was very much in love with her from high school on. And um, so she became his muse. And she, uh, she, uh, you know, was the original Bodhi Broad. And, you know, my dad, um, another influence here is um, Wally Wood, another comic book superstar. Um, and Wally Wood was one of the first people to do erotic superhero comic, like, like, like use that style, you know, but, but do erotic stuff with it. And, uh, he worked for Disney and, and all the, all the, you know, DC, Marvel, I mean, he, right. he worked for everybody, you know, but, but he, his, his way of drawing little nymphs, the little wood nymphs, um, and, and like little naked girls. My father picked right up on that and like I said and one day it was like like a switch went off like 1968 my dad was drawing very linear kind of straight up and down girls you know very linear and and tall and all of a sudden one day they just went Boop, and it, and they were like you know like her like, can you show her the, show, show us the Bodhi broad behind you this one yeah <laughs> uh, this is the, the metal sculpture by Metal Man Ed and I. I love it. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you just, uh, you just hang out, you know. <laughs> Amazing. But, uh, yeah, there's there's other Bodhi broads around here somewhere. Yeah, that... the, you know what? There, there's something I want to show um, folks who may have not... Uh, uh, I've seen this before, uh, and I and I have to say, since I was young, I've always imagined what Cheech would be like, live or or animated. And this is a short uh, 3D animation I found online. Mm -hmm. uh, tell us about this project. Well, it's a guy named Nigel Hendrickson, and uh, he was a fan, and and he approached me. He he was working on this out of pocket. And it was pretty early on, you know, like early 90s. And um, and he did all this stuff himself, you know. And, and then I came in and helped him with the, with the voices because um, my father had very particular voices for, for all the characters, which he practiced in his cartoon concerts. And I picked up, genetically, I picked up those voices like, ah, oh, gee, Cheech, I'm yeah. super trick. Not now. You know, like. I know exactly how they talk. You should do me a trick now, right now, or I'm gonna fucking get pissed off, or whatever, you know, whatever he says. You know? <laughs> Don't jerk off to the Bible, fuzzballs. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just making this shit up. <laughs> but he inevitably gets the, you know, the, uh, the time distortion trick, and he gets kicked in the balls. <laughs> the, poor, the poor lizard always gets kicked in the balls. Yeah. And I tell you the story that, about that. Um, my father and I used to box when I was a little kid. And he'd be on his knees on the bed and I'd be on, you know, on my feet. And we both had boxing gloves. And every time it got heated, because my father inevitably would have the upper hand, I would hit him in the balls as hard as I could. And then he'd drop him. And he just like, ah! <laughs> and and he, and he would just, he'd be like, I'm gonna get you, ah! And and so uh, he, my character was the lizard, and and he was Cheech. See, so inside the hat is always my father, and I was always the five year old stupid Cheech uh, lizard, you know, character. 
And so eventually he started kicking them in the balls all the time. And that's why I get kicked in the balls forever. And so <laughs> if, if we were to kind of psychoanalyze this, you know, the him and the hat, you know, him hiding his identity, uh, the secret identity, uh, perhaps. Um, what the, his height, despite his talent and also recognition uh, and also admiration, was he a recluse? Was he a, was he shy about success? Uh, um, my father shy? No. No, but he was uh, he's very. Uh, you know, when he walked into a room, the. the it was like a light bulb went on, you know, it's like, I'll never meet anybody quite like that, you know, like, like the whole room could be like, you know, down in the dumps and all of a sudden Vaughn show up and the light, light would go on, you know, and, and he, his, uh, his, his charisma and, and his, uh, zealot, you know, he had like a, um, he, he was just like, he had a, a, a joy for life, you know, and the things around you. And like, you just go for a walk with him and, you know, a little ant toiling over carrying a, a leaf, you know, he's like, look at, look at this incredible thing he's doing, you know, like, and we'd sit there for half an hour watching this, this little ant try to struggle with this leaf for some, you know, who knows reason. If I can, you know, to let you know that he drew, uh, Vaughn drew some ants. He illustrated them. And I think Kel and Crash painted them on a train ah. back in the day. Oh, of yeah. all things, ants. So I love tying that history, that story, because it's such an odd thing to pick up on. Right? Yeah. But it's, it, it, it shows the kind of inquisitiveness that Vaughn had about nature. Well, yeah, I mean, so you know. if, if I can, because I, I want to know more about you. Um, if you have any, you have anything you want to share with us uh, of special memory? Uh, well, let's see. Um, I mean, like current stuff or no, like a, a, maybe something that you wanted to show us, whether it's your dad's or or yours um well I, i'll get to my stuff i i just did a you know i just did some new uh, work for heavy metal magazine I'll, I'll show you that in a little bit but um i think what we should do is is explain some things you know because even people like george lucas and stuff like people like they 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 do backgrounds and stuff when they you know, like background, you know, work on, on like the planets and stuff like that. But my father was one of the only cartoonists that, that would make a planet Wow! before he would, uh, before he would start drawing, you know, he would make the planet first. And this was actually, if you could see, this is, this is my ball from when I was a kid. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, he, and, he, and he stole it from me. He goes, I need that. And I, and I was playing with it. And then, and then he comes back an hour later. He says, I made a planet. <laughs> and I just start crying, you know, because I can't play with my ball anymore. <laughs> but I still have it. <laughs> That's amazing. It's a cent ball from the, from the grocery store. But what he would do is he would, uh, he would imagine his characters walking across the, the 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 hill here and what they would see this way he'd use a magnifying glass and what they see that way and then a little 20 minutes later they're they're over here and they would see this lake you know and and he would see it from all the directions and and choose his panels so you get this real place a real time and 20 minutes later you're over here on the other side of the hill looking at something completely different um, and he got real with it. I mean, check this out. This wow. is a fucking planet. <laughs> <laughs> wow. This is Bodhi fucking said, you know, this is, you know. Amazing. This is yeah. 
this is Summer Mouse. This is where Cheech Wizard lives. And it's it's uh, made out of fiberglass. And it's got it's got uh, plates that are shifting over the years because the ball is shrinking. And so you have plates that are shifting. It's it's a real planet and I've had to repair it a bunch of times, but it has little earthquakes and has real things going on with it. And this is real stuff, you know, like and it's probably why this stuff holds up so well over the years is because it, it's a real time place. And um and in, in terms in terms of his work that that remains today um it, was he heavily collected when at some point or did he leave the estate to you and barbara was he heavily collected when he died yeah be, before or after he died oh yeah Ali, he he was um you know he was a, a an a, you know a, a comet he was going through our atmosphere, you know. He he just wasn't meant for here, for too long. He he belonged to the universe, and um, and he unfortunately left early um, because of it. But um, but but he, his um, he reached he right when he died. He was reaching all the things that a, a cartoonist would want to achieve, you know. Like he he did a his cartoon concert. At the ballroom adjacent to um, to to the Louvre in Paris, and he packed the place. I mean, Mobius, Bilal, mm. all you know, uh, all all the big time cartoonists in France were there, and they packed the place. And my father had had arrived, you know, and and he was working on two animated movies at the time. Um, if he had lived just another. Uh, maybe six months to a year, we'd have a Bodhi film, probably not by Bakshi, definitely not by Bakshi. Right. What's the backstory on that? Because we, we, we all thought that he was working on something with him, Ralph Bashki, and we saw that he kind of lifted some of Bodhi's uh, work. Or is that contentious? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Always oh, a good mood in it when I'm talking about that. Okay. Um, uh, no, Bakshi was my dad's agent um, in 69 to 71 or so. Um, and Bakshi was trying to get my dad animated and making Xerox of all, all his stuff. Uh, Cobalt 60, you know, Cheech Wizard, the whole deal. And, um, and then Bakshi uh, landed Fritz the Cat. And... Crumb didn't want to be animated. He never does. He he still doesn't. That's why you don't see any animated stuff of Crumb. Um, but Bakshi knew that Crumb was out of town, and and uh, so Bakshi went to his wife in San Francisco here and showed her a hundred thousand dollar check. It said, "Sign here, and I'll give you this check." And she had never seen that much money in her life. And she signed without mm -hmm. reading it. And so in that contract, it, it said that Bakshi owned everything Fritz the Cat from then on. And, and Crumb didn't, didn't, uh, didn't own any of it. Wow. And my father said, you know what? Over my dead body, are we going to work together after what you did to Bob? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that's what happened. <laughs> but yeah, if you look at if you look at wizards, you know. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. I mean, you well, already know that. Right after my dad died, it yeah. happened. Yeah. And um, and there it is. You know, uh, Cobalt sixty became Necron ninety nine. Cheech Wizard became Avatar. The Bodhi Broads became the Little Princess with the wings. I mean, it's all yeah. there. On, on and on. And, and, and no, so Bakshi, Bakshi did call me to uh, apologize a few years ago. Really? What was that conversation like? Oh, he's like, well, Mark, uh, you know, your dad and I loved each other, you know, and uh, I just want to call you, uh, call you, apologize about the, uh, the uh, influence there on the, on the wizards there. Yeah. 
and I was like, what? <laughs> I was like, really? <laughs> it's like, dude, you know, like, show me the check. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, uh, but he must have been getting it all these years, you know, people, the more, he didn't realize that I was going to come along and revive it all, you know. What right. a nightmare, right? You thought right. you were rid of this guy. You well, the, the, ideas. you and the whole culture of graffiti, <laughs> for that matter. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, uh, interesting. How old Came were you when he, vengeance. How, how old were you when he passed? 12 years old, yeah. Well, oh, wow. Yeah. So that must have been a bit traumatic for you. Oh, yeah. I mean, but he, he, he prepared me pretty well for it. I mean, he was one foot out kind of guy, you know, yeah. like he, he was floating off the ground, three feet off the ground all the time. So, um, you know, I kind of knew he was going to go that way. He said, uh, Mark, God country is first. That's where we come from. That's where we're going. And it's beautiful and it's glorious. And don't fear it. it it's, it's a beautiful thing. It's where we come from. And, and, uh, and I, you know, it became a religion, you know, like, you know, I mean, you know, Cheech, every time my father went to these places, um, he'd come back and he could teach better, had more of an understanding of, of, of the universe and where we come from. He had more to put into his comics, you know, like Cheech Wizard, you know. Right. But, and he was also a, kind of pursuing a, an, an enlightened life, wasn't he? Uh, oh, yeah. You know. Yes, I mean he. Man, if you just take a picture of when he what he looked like in 1965, and then what he looked like in 75, you wouldn't you wouldn't know it's the same person. You yeah. Know? And, and Mark, he, yeah. Oh, I, but yeah. <laughs> no, I was just going to take a moment to pause and let you know because I'm looking at the feed and all the people who are expressing themselves with love and gratitude for you sharing your your father's story your personal family story uh for you picking up the torch uh and uh and y you know the, the the comments and of course people will ask us questions later but um I see know, Seth right there <laughs> yeah know that we really appreciate I can't you see so well so i don't <laughs> acknowledge you it's not because i i don't see you <laughs> no, I, I, we, you, you and your dad are beloved by us uh, for bringing us this art. Um, and of course, you know, when it, it's important that we understand um, some of this backstory, right, about the world he was coming from and the influence he was having at a time when there, was, there wasn't this internet or anything like that. There wasn't mm -hmm. the, the kind of outlets for an, uh, a prolific mind like that. But thankfully, you are right, and and at an early age, even though he passed at twelve, you were already picking up and learning from him, uh, and uh, you started to pursue your own interests in art. Well, I wanted to, I wanted to be like him. I I, I idolized him. Uh, I knew from a very small child. I mean, I was two or three years old when I picked up the pen, and. Uh, and he would give me 25 cents to do a strip and I would sit there and it was really to keep me out of his hair while he worked, you know, but I was, cause my mom would have a straight job and, and he'd be watching me at home. So he would uh, have me draw strips and he'd give me a quarter for each strip and he'd do four strips and make a dollar. And, uh, and I, I, I just, I mean, three years old, I was at it, you know, I was doing comic strips and, um, and as I got older, um, I wanted to work with him and he said, we're going to be Bodie and son. It's going to be huge. And, uh, and, and, and I was working on it. I mean, I, I gave up my childhood to get better at it. And, you know, by the time I was 12, I, I could really, I was really doing some decent stuff. By the time I was 15, I was a professional, you know? So, you know, I think a few years, like right as soon as he died, I, 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 I cut off all my, my friends at my age and I just started drawing five hours a day wow. and um and it it catapulted me right into following his footsteps and right at, at that at that age were you already mastering how to draw the Bodhi universe 
the the Cheech Wizard and the Lizards. I wouldn't say mastering, but I I made a I made a uh, a progression. I understood it, you know, and and so by the time I was uh, let's see, at fifteen, I was collaring for zoo, you know, for heavy metal, and then um, eighteen, I I met Archie Goodwin at Epic Illustrated and started inking and coloring my father's unfinished works, and then. Uh, a year later, we started on Cobalt 60 with Larry Todd, who was my dad's buddy and uh, a, a, a apprentice and collaborator. Did a lot of the covers for um, Eerie and Creepy Magazine and Vampirilla uh, with Larry. Um, and Larry wrote the story and I was 18, 19 and I was, I was penciling and inking, coloring, lettering. Uh -huh. So I made a very, Progressional thing right. of it, and then I, I, you know, then I hit with Miami Mice in the early '80s. Right. I have an image up here of Miami Mice, but before that, I just have a, a question to ask you: um, Was was Deadbone um, released after his 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 death, or before? Uh, Deadbone was in Cavalier first, Cavalier magazine, which is a oh, that's uh, right. A, a nudie, uh, yeah. A nudie I, used to, I, used to, I used to read that. Yeah, you know, <laughs> when my mom and dad broke up and my father moved to San Francisco and I was left in Rochester, New York with my mom to keep up on my dad's stuff, I'd sneak into the corner store, grab a Cavalier, and as quick as I could, I'd go to my dad's pages to see what he was, what comics he was working on. And then the store owner would go, Ken, what are you doing there? Put that down. You can't read that. And I'm like, oh, my father's uh, in the comics yeah. here. He, he does the comics. And he's like, yeah, kid, put it down. <laughs> I'll, so, I'll, share, I'll share something with you. Because when I, <laughs> when I was a kid and discovered him, uh, we, we used to steal his, steal his comics at places like Soho's at infamously in New York. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, mm -hmm. and they That's, had where all... That's where we met. Yeah. And, and they had all this erotica. And then when we discovered, oh, he's in Cavalier, look out for the Cavaliers as well, you know, snag those and rip the pages out, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I didn't care about the nudies. I was looking at those since I was a little kid. I, I, didn't, I didn't care about naked girls. I, I so, want to see the comics, right. you know? So the Deadbone book was really influential to all of us. I mean, back in them days, we... we we uh, always were looking out. I mean, they were hard to find uh, 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 for a while. Uh, so I was glad it was republished. But coming back to you, we also discovered that, wait, Vaughn has a son and he draws as well as him. And, and, and Miami Mice was it. You, we, we used to grab those off the racks as well. Well, Miami Mice was actually my wife Molly's idea. She, there was a, there was a, uh, you know, a T-shirt that said Miami Mice when Miami Vice came out, and it was, you know, the kind of thing you see at a Carney game, you know, and you, you, you throw the ball at the pins and you win the Miami Mice T-shirt or the yeah. mirror, or whatever, and and Molly goes, you know, that make a really good comic, you know, and the Ninja Turtles had just hit, they weren't on TV yet, they were, you know, Kevin and Pete had just done the comics and uh and and sold out like every time they print it they sold out and they were only at the very beginning of this when i did the miami mice so i got on the coattails of them and miami mice sold like 180,000 copies you know in a year's time wow that's those are good numbers yeah and that was my first comic it was very disillusioning because because you're like wow you know it's only gonna get better <laughs> and, and, it, and it didn't <laughs> I I ended it thinking that I could I could do whatever I wanted now, and uh, and I got back to something I really wanted to do, and the numbers went down to like two thousand or something, and I, I was like, oops. <laughs> and so and and so, you kept freelancing. I I would imagine you were doing this, but you were also doing a lot of other uh, commercial public in publications as well. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. I mean, always busy, you know, to make a living in art, you got to be really diverse. I mean, I, I, you know, especially in comics. Oh, my God. You know, I just did like uh, 150 hours work on, 
on this heavy metal stuff and I don't even want to talk about money. <laughs> yeah. When it comes down to it, I think I'm making less than somebody at McDonald's, you know. But uh, but you do it for other reasons, you know. You do it for love, and then you, uh, you know, and, and then um, it turns into other things, you know, like licensing, you know, like T-shirts, posters, skateboards. Right. You know, Let me ask you something, Mark. It, while you're going through this process, right, you're you're trying to come into your own. Um, and you know, try to break in your own. Um, it, you know, was was your father's legacy something that kind of just loomed over you in terms of of you know his his success or his almost big time success or where he left off? Um, what 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 was it that um, provoked you to? to bring him his work and legacy back to us oh man well you know he encouraged me you know as everybody every parent out there should encourage your kids to do whatever their heart desires and encourage them like feed feed the plant you know like let it grow and i mean you know my wife and i um you know, um, encouraged our daughter in music, and she's a country honky tonk singer. You know, and she travels all over the place, and she's she's wonderful. I mean, she's like a Patsy Cline type, you know, mm. voice, beautiful voice. Wonderful. And we just we just let her do her thing, and you know, and, and same with me. You know, my dad like always oh, so proud that I I wanted to follow in his footsteps. So he every day he's like, you can do whatever you can. Whatever you want, Mark. You, you could, you know, start an animation company. You do this, you do that. You know, like do it all. You know, and like, and so I had this, this, this fake sense of, you know, you know, like uh, self that, you know, that I I could do anything. You know, like, and it helped. It helped over the years. You know, like when you get to those low points and you, you of know, course. you go off and do something else. You know, but, um, uh, but yeah, um, you know, if you could. If you lose somebody that you love, you know, like, you know, bottom line is if my dad passed away and I loved him so, and admired him so much, you know, that if, if, you know, and when he died, all the characters died with him and I can revive them, you know, like that was, that was a must, you know, <laughs> that was like, I can't let Cheech Wizard and the lizards and all my buddies die that's that ain't gonna happen on my clock <laughs> you know? so i just just perpetuated in any way i can in different ways that my dad didn't you know i mean there will only be one vaughn you know and like yeah he, and and he's he was a comet that came through well, our life there's one and a half vaughns you're the other <laughs> you're, you're that half uh, you know and and, and i i really appreciate you um telling us this and sharing this with us this is you, you know I, just to let everybody know we're going to continue this conversation because instagram cuts us off it's the first hour because the, the next part of this is is it already been an hour yeah oh my it's God. been an hour <laughs> Gadzooks. i got more stuff out of the aisle. no no wait we're going to get to that I'm, what i'm going to do is uh we're going to come back i'm going to save the video and i want everybody to stay on board uh, because we, we we have lots of questions and there are things we want to see from you uh, yeah. we we, we uh, want to talk about this next chapter uh, mm -hmm. of you revitalizing your father's work and how important that is and I'm so glad you shared what you did because it's so legitimate you know it's so legitimate from birth you know this is it, this has been almost predestined for you and it's it's a very touching story uh uh it's it's moving and uh you know i appreciate you sharing that with us um so for we're going to close out with this and uh saying thank you for this first part and we're going to start up again <laughs> there that's, he, oh, that's, uh, i want to know about this that's the cheech that my dad used to have the stars to draw from he even signed it 
This is the kind of stuff amazing. I got more of this stuff to show you. So, so excellent. Ah. All right, so I'm gonna save this video. Come back folks. to Space Station Bodie. We'll be right back. <laughs> yes, we'll be right back. Thank you. Thank you all for joining us. Make sure to stay on. Give us two minutes. That's